lower your tone now because we all grown now the bitch you did don't mean nothing you home now that just mean you can catch two in your dome now really have a going home party alone now damn <laughs> man you already know what it is jay williams let's live life and we're back it's been a 10 day hiatus for our covid for the third time and you know here we are I have a large household, six people to be exact in my house, including myself. Everybody got sick. So let me run this down to you real quick. That Friday that, you know, I let everybody know, hey, I'm sick. Woke up that morning and it felt like you know, that little wind up monkey with the symbol, bing, bing, bing. That's what it felt like inside my head. Literally felt like there was somebody in there with a hammer just trying to beat their way out of my skull. I wake up, I sit on the side of the bed, and I'm like, oh, man, what's going on? As soon as I touch my head, I feel the fever. Great. It's a Friday. I have to get my guys paid. That is my job as a boss. Your boss, you don't get to just say, screw everybody else. I don't feel good. Nobody gets paid today. So I get up, I get dressed, I go to work. I already start distancing myself. I have no clue it's COVID, but just to be cautious, I kind of keep my distance from everybody. The week prior to that, actually wasn't even a week, it was maybe three or four days prior to that, my son called in work sick. He does never miss work. This boy is at work no matter what. He's like an assistant manager where he works at. I didn't pick up on it. Just thought it was one of them summer cold, summer flu. You know how it goes. Well, that Friday, I'm at work. Wife calls, tells me her sister's sick. Her sister's been staying with us. Says she tested positive for COVID. My response was, I've got it. How do you know you got it? You ain't even took a test. Mind you now, I just told y'all how I felt when I woke up that morning. She tested my son. He come back positive. Now, he went to a concert all up in the mosh pit, people everywhere, people crowded. Pretty sure that's where he got it from. I get home that day. I test. Bam! Got COVID for the third time. It was rough. No way around it. I'm not going to sit here and cry, but it was definitely rough, man. None of your favorites. And then as I started to get better, my little boy Noah gets sick, five years old. Right behind him, Bella gets sick. She's three years old. So now the whole house is quarantined off. I think my wife was the only one that didn't test positive for COVID. So as I'm going through the getting better process, I'm tasked with taking care of the little kids. So we made it happen, man. We stayed in the room. I isolate ourselves from everybody and we got better. I actually got back to work last week. Yesterday was Sunday, I worked yesterday. Started to make a video yesterday and I just was not feeling, still regaining my energy. But that is that, got to work this morning. Been seeing some things I don't like. Attempted to talk with one of my guys and it didn't go well. So I had one video planned out for the day and that's the, it was more of an upbeat, cheerful video. But I ain't gonna lie, my mood just went dark after this conversation I had this morning. So I'm gonna get into some of these prison extortions I've seen. These jailhouse extortions. These dudes that just try to use their size or their gang or their reputation to take from others, to take from guys that they feel they're better or bigger than. You will see it. Whether you become a victim to it, well, that's going to be up to you. I ain't never been extorted. Have I had guys shoot that shot? Yeah, absolutely. But that's what it was. It was a shot. What you do in the moment when somebody presses up on you is going to determine a lot. It's going to determine what happens tomorrow gonna determine what happens next Friday when you go to commissary. 
is pretty much going to set the pace moving forward. You might just get your ass kicked standing up for yourself. But in doing that, you can avoid a whole lot of other stuff moving forward. That's what we're doing today. These extortions, these penitentiary tough guys. These guys that just want to run around trying to take something from the next man. Anyways, you know how to see me. You know how to live this. So, let's relive. Rain, rain, and more rain. All it has done for weeks is rain. I got to hop out this truck, get some of this work done before the sky just opens all the way up, and then we'll get today's video started. Be back in a minute. Well, probably be a couple hours, but I'll be right back. Gotta love editing. Hours have passed. I am officially drenched, like soaking wet. So I was looking up extortion, right? History would tell you that extortion started in the 1300s, back in Sicily. People came in, started extorting landowners. Hey, look, there's a whole lot of violence going on around y'all. If you don't want to be a part of it, you pay us, we'll take care of them. If not, you gotta worry about them and you gotta worry about us. Be more worried about us. That's what it kind of breaks extortion down to. As you know, years, years ago, the mafia played a big part of extortion. Extorting small businesses, companies. You're going to break off that check, that bag of money, every single week, or we'll burn the store to the ground. We'll take your food trucks. You won't get your deliveries. You can eat, but we're going to eat too. Extortion went from that to being a thing in prisons and jails, a very big thing in prisons and jails. I had seen forms of it in the streets, but I wouldn't exactly call it what I saw in the jail. My own boy P I've talked about before was like the king of stick-ups. And for me to paint a picture of this dude, this dude is like a white short gorilla that's always got some large caliber gun that was very violent, that was known for using his guns was known and dudes didn't really mess with this dude man dudes he was like the neighborhood Debo and this didn't matter if this was in white neighborhoods black neighborhoods Spanish neighborhoods anywhere he went he used the same level of violence he acted the same he didn't change up around nobody I remember ride with him and my homeboy AC rest in peace AC one time and I'm like yo where we going he's like we gotta run down the projects real quick I gotta pick something up I'm under the impression that's exactly what we're doing. I'm just riding down in the projects with him. We go down in there, he parks. And at the time, this is a place called Wormsley Terrace that was insane. This project back then had bodies coming out of there nonstop. It's one way in, one way out. The only reason you go down in there is to buy a crack or if you live in there or you're the police or a paramedic. No other reason for you to be down there. He tells me, I gotta go down there and pick something up. We go down in there with him, me and AC walk with him. Not, we're not gonna let him walk by himself, it's my homeboy. And there's all these dudes over there at the playground area. This is probably 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And it's the weekend and these dudes are out there hustling. I mean, it's a bunch of dudes. I'm still under the impression that he knows one of these dudes. He's going over there to collect something that somebody owes him. Maybe he paid them early in the day. Maybe it's something they owed him from back when. He always has something going on. We get up close on him, and dude says something, and before he can say anything, P opens his coat, pulls out this mat, lays everybody down. Run their pockets. What? Run their pockets. Like, take everything out of their pockets. Man, you're tripping. I don't say that, because I'm not gonna say that in front of these dudes. My homeboy was a nut. Me and AC run everybody's pockets. Dude's got guns on them, take guns up off of them. He tells them, go in the house. I'm going to hustle out here tonight, and then I'll be gone. In a way, that's a form of extortion. I'm going to allow y'all to continue to hustle out here, but I'm going to take what y'all got on y'all tonight, and y'all can return to y'all's regularly scheduled program tomorrow. But tonight, this is my block. True story. Put it on my mother. Put it on my kids. Crazy times in life, right? The whole time we were at the, at the little park area hustling, 
I'm looking at the apartment windows and I can see people in the projects peeking out the window. I'm like, any minute now, man, one of these dudes is going to let shots off out the window and just spray us and kill us. They didn't. I didn't go back down. I actually got locked up not long after that. And the apartment complex turned over. The police took over, started evicting people, and the neighborhood kind of made a comeback. It's not that bad now. You got much worse projects. That was one of the first times I'd actually seen somebody take something with a stipulation, form of extortion. Y'all can go back to hustling tomorrow. I need what y'all got on y'all now. Go on about your business. And that's what he did. I get into the jail and extortion is rampant, especially with the introduction of the gangs. And the main gang at the time, well, the main gang still being to this day, them blood dudes. And when this all took place, there was not a lot of blood dudes in the jail at the time. When I came into the pod, there was this dude named KD. And KD was a big ass dude. He's what you would expect when you think of somebody running down on somebody and saying, get, give it up. Let me get that. Somebody extorting somebody. That's who KD was. But the thing with KD was is he had started recruiting these other little blood dudes. This dude's from up north. So I don't know if it was Jersey, New York, but he had one of those up top accents. I had a habit of when I come into jail because I was still stupid and young minded and I had been taught wrong that if you get the fighting out the way, as soon as it presents itself, it kind of sends a message to everybody to leave you alone. So most times when I would go to jail, I wouldn't be in there very long before some type of an altercation, a fight, a scuffle, something would happen. I would make sure that it happened. I'd usually try to make sure that other people seen it to kind of send a message to win, lose, or draw. Leave me alone. I'm willing to fight behind mine. I get in there. None of this is taking place. What I see when I come in is that this dude KD is running around with these five, six other little blood dudes. And they've got certain dudes they're taking stuff from. When I come in the jail, I just missed commissary. So I didn't get no bag. But I seen other dudes collect their bags. And everybody locks down in this just Riverside Regional Jail, which is just a jail that's a collection of different cities throughout Virginia. You got Hopewell, you got Richmond, you got Chesterfield. You got all these different cities crammed into this one regional jail. And most times it's because you've got violent charges or the main jail is overflowed and they just stick you in there. I've always had bad charges. Bad charges meaning violent charges. Like So I would always get sent to Riverside. They take me, put me in the regular jail. I stay there 72 hours. I get on the bus off to Riverside. I go, no way fans or bus about it every single time. I was not used to seeing the gangs in the jail like that. So like I said, I come in, everybody's going to commissary. We got all our cells locked and they pop each cell as they call the name out and the guy comes out and gets his commissary. He goes and locks down and they do this throughout the day until commissary's done. When commissary is done and they pop all the cell doors out, open, I see KD come out and there's an area underneath the staircase where there's a phone where dudes used to congregate. You could also get a fight in over there. The guards couldn't see it. It's a blind spot. A lot of stuff went down on the staircase. My cell happened to be directly in front of this phone. And we come out and these dudes are already squatted up right in front of my cell where this pay phone is. And they're talking, they're plotting, they're up to no good. I've had no introduction to them. The old head I'm in the cell with tells me the rundown of who's in the pod and who's doing what and about the gangs. I hadn't really seen it firsthand yet. These dudes are almost like in a football huddle over here talking coming up with what they're going to do. And they branch off. Three goes this way, and then KD takes three of them, and they go that way. And these dudes go up to the top tier, and these dudes start at the bottom tier, and they've got select cells that they're going by and making dudes break it off. And when I mean break it off, it's like, yo, I gave you that list. You get that? And there's not going to be much of anything outside of here you go, or it's going to be they're just going to come in and straight attack you and assault you. I stand in my doorway in disbelief. This is one of the first times I've seen this take place in this jail. I've been in this jail many times, but never have I seen a group of guys, especially a group of gang members, just so openly just going and taking stuff from dudes. And the primary suspects were white dudes, younger white dudes or really old white dudes. If you were a thorough white dude, somebody that 
you can look and tell, like, oh, he's been in the prison before. Whole head blasted in ink, neck, sleeves, and just completely covered and jacked up. It's not the dudes they were going after. They were going after the little dudes from the suburbs, the dudes that had fresh track marks on their arms, and the old guys that couldn't defend themselves. I can respect if you and the man got a beef, and you run up on him and say, give me that. That is penitentiary rules coming into play. That's what happens. Somebody disrespects you. You got a couple options in what you could do. But a lot of times dudes will just run down on them and be like, go ahead and pack that up. Let me get it before I hurt you. And they'll just show everybody that display of dominance right there by taking their stuff. Their display of dominance was different because they weren't equal opportunity. And, you know, when it, it, when it came down to it, they were picking who they were going to run down on. Like clockwork, these dudes go around with this commissary bag and just go to sell to sell, fill that bag up, take it down to the one dude's cell, come out with another bag, continue their journey. So they filled up several bags with all these dudes' commissary. I'm standing there and I'm just watching. I'm not saying nothing. I don't know none of these dudes in the jail at this point, right? Just got in here. So I'm just watching. And what I'm doing in my head is I'm sizing these dudes up. I'm thinking, Damn, that dude KD is a big ass dude Like out of everybody He's the one I hope I don't have to get into it with If they decide to come over here And try to apply pressure on me Like they've done them They're going to have to beat me up That's just what it's going to be I'm going to fight Y'all going to understand that Each and every time you come over here I'm going to fight I will bite you I will do whatever I got to do There are no rules when it comes to fighting And not being locked up right Later that evening, they come out, they make their meals, they've made this big, big meal, and these other dudes that they've ran down on and extorted are just going about their business, making their little meals like nothing happened. Like, we all didn't just see this happening, but as I talk to my celly some more, he says, nah, this has been going on. My celly been in there like four or five months. He's like, KD came back in about six, seven months ago, recruited a couple of these little dudes, brought them home, ate them blood, and this is what they've been doing for about five, six months now. He's like, dudes is checking in. Dudes is dropping kites on them. The guards ain't doing nothing. The guards knew what was going on, but as long as ain't nobody bleeding, we don't need medical in here. Y'all got to worry, you know, handle your own. You're all men in here. You don't like it, make bail. That's what you say. You don't like jail, make bail. Go home. You don't like it, don't come to jail. The guards wouldn't do nothing about it. They would come in, do the bare minimum, sit at their desk all day, and unless a fight pops off, they're not getting up to do nothing. Most times they didn't have enough guards to do rounds. So you could be in your cell dead and they wouldn't even know it until lockdown and they came through to count and make sure nobody had dug a tunnel up out of there. Then they'd find your body. That's how understaffed they were. I just know in the back of my mind, like, these, you mean, you get paranoid. You see it going on, you're thinking, yeah, they're going to try me. They're going to try me. I waited, waiting to see if they could come over there. This is during that day. Nothing happens. Better part of a week passes, I'd have put my commissary slip in, and I seen these dudes going to the guys that they were extorting, handing them pieces of paper. Slide up on them like their buddies. Hey, man, what's up? Look, got this piece of paper for you right here. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and uh, get that, and I'll keep KD up off you, or we won't come over here and beat you up. Begging myself, they bring me a piece of paper, I'm just going to tighten up whoever brings me the piece of paper, right? Doesn't happen. Sitting out there with, now I used to play a lot of tunk. In the beginning of my bids, I would play cards. Now I absolutely hate cards. I got a crazy card story for y'all also. I'll, I'll share with y'all here soon. But I'm out there playing cards, and the two dudes we were playing against got up and left. Two blood dudes come and sit down. They get to chopping up, we talking. Where you from? I tell them where I'm from. They know people from the same neighborhood. Dude Chris, another dude Derek, different dudes from out where I lived at. I had no problems. But I did end up getting into a conversation with one of the dudes and asking them, like, I said, so all y'all pretty much do is just extort the dudes y'all know y'all can beat up. Why would we go against the grain? Why would we want to cause a big uprising in here, get to fighting, have to hurt somebody, when you can look and tell who we can take from? I never really forgot that conversation. A conversation stuck close to my brain and it still does to this day and moving forward in life especially once i got to prison i didn't have to be told that again i saw it i saw the guys that were extorting guys and i saw the types of guys they were extorting 
They're not going to go after the guy that's brolic. The guy that's built like that. That's got the big ass traps and the big boulders. That's not who they want. If you're the guy that's timid, slouched, you look scared, you look like you ain't going to do nothing, you're who they coming for. If you're that old man that walks with a cane, and I know a lot of people will say, old people are off limits. Why didn't y'all do something? Why didn't you jump in? If you're that old man, they're coming for you. This is the way jail works and prison works. The only person you're responsible for in there is yourself. If you go around fighting the battle of every man you see that has been victimized or that somebody else is doing wrong, well, you'd still be fighting to this day. The fighting would never stop. And what's going to happen is, at the moment you inject yourself into a situation to defend that man, he pauses what he's got going on with him. And all the attention shifts right to you. So now you've got to fight his battle. And guess what? No matter what the outcome is, when it's all said and done, they're going to go right back to extorting that old man. Yes, it's sad to see at times. You see people, you see them go to the visits, you see them sitting with their wives, you see them sitting talking through the glass to their kids, their grandkids, their neighbors, whoever they got coming to see them. And they have no clue that when this guy goes back to the dorm, goes back to the pod, that he's got to break it off. And if he don't, they'll break him off. Most times these guys just smile amongst the family members because nobody wants to be the punk in jail. Nobody wants to be like, man, these guys are taking my stuff. I can't believe they're doing this to me. Nah, most guys will lie. How you doing in there? I'm holding up. Guys all right to you? Yeah, they treat me fair. But behind closed doors, it's everything but that. Throughout different jails, different prisons, different states, I've seen things done differently. Take, for instance, in Philly, in the F, in the House of Corrections. Dudes were running down on dudes. But it wasn't on no, we'll keep you safe from these guys. If you don't give it to us, my homeboys and them are gonna beat you up. It was on some, you're gonna give it to us or we're gonna beat you up. Straight like that. We still might beat you up the first time, the first go round, just to set the pace and let you know things are real. That was common in Philly. Philly, it wasn't, a lot of times it wouldn't be three or four dudes that would show up at your cell. It would be one dude that was sure enough known for knocking dudes out in there that would just pick somebody randomly that he didn't like, didn't like the way they looked, and would run up on their cell and break it off. And if the dude said no, well, nine times out of 10, he got beat up. Then the dude just went in his box and took it. I had a dude try me. I'm not sure if I spoke on this story before. I'm gonna leave the dude's name out just because of some of the things he did in prison and I'm almost sure he got out of prison somehow. Me and Banky were actually talking about dude because dude used to be Banky Pound's cellmate. If y'all don't know about Banky Pound, check out TBP, Team Banky Pound. Go subscribe, Banky's good people, man. Did a lot of time in prison, came out, has made the best of his life. But we were talking about one of his old cellmates. Trying to think of a name to get his due. Because like I said, I don't want to put his name out because I don't know what he's got going on in life today. For all I know, the way life turns out, he could be a pastor or a minister. Or he could be anybody at this point in life after all the years in prison. Um, we're just going to call a dude. He had a nickname, so we'll just take a part of his nickname. We're just going to call a dude John. He was one of the only people to ever try to extort me and out of everybody that you wanted to you never wanted to deal with that to begin with this is not the dude you wanted to have those type of issues with he's an old school convict banky you know exactly what i'm talking about bald head light skin greasy as a pork chop and he is the definition of a killer he is the definition of a convict He's weirded out all the way in the head. Sneaks and messes with those boys. But aside from that, he had a dope habit. Dope habit meaning he used to like to sniff that dope, sniff that hair on. His choice of getting money in there was either taking it from dudes, 
running up on dudes with the knife, borrowing things and bucking, or extorting dudes, going up on them and making up some story of how they owe him some money or somebody they know owes him some money or he would just pull the knife on him and tell him, come store day, you don't have it, see this? I'm gonna stick this right in the side of your neck. He had been known for doing things like this in the past. So it wasn't a question of, will he really stab me? Question him, look like you're gonna question him and he's gonna stick you with his knife. I talked about the cellmate I had, Crazy L. I despised Crazy L. To this day, I don't like L at all. Never will. He he was getting ready to go home. I had to, Me and L ended up getting into it because L was also a tall black dude, but he was extremely racist. Always white boy this, white boy that. And one night, he said it one too many times. I had tried to play cool with this dude. I couldn't take it no more. I snapped off on him. Me and L ended up getting into it in the cell. The TV gets broke. The, where our cell at the time was right in front of the control booth so the officer could see our shadows and hear the tussling and the fighting in the cell. These other officers come running in. I back up. I done did my thing. L's forehead split open. I'm okay. I got the average stuff that comes with fighting, but I definitely 100% whooped L. I didn't win all fights. I definitely won that one. Hands down, I won that one. He decides he wants to fight with the guards, right? The guards did that man dirty. When I'm telling you they did him dirty, I got back out the way, and they commenced to what I did to him wasn't nothing compared to what they did to him. When they were done with him, they had busted his eyebrows open, broke his nose. I mean, his chin was smashed where it hit the side of the bunk. It looked like somebody just took a bucket of blood and just dumped it out, and they just slung it all over the cell. That was from the ass when the guards gave him. When the ass when I gave him, there was some blood on the sheets from where his, there was this knob that you could crank open the window, and that's what cracked his head open is when I slammed him over there and I, we were tussing, I slung him and boom, his head hit that knob and it peeled his head open. But these guards took it way, way past what I did. They ended up not even charging me for the fight. I stood back, they did what they did, they took him up out of there, ended up bringing me a bucket, mop, I cleaned the blood up, that was the end of, that. That was the end of Crazy L, right? I hate it. Crazy L. I know that's a strong word. He And like I said, he used to brag about, man, I'm getting ready to go home. This dude was a smoker on the streets. All he did was talk about how he stole stuff, ran around with prostitutes, and smoked crack. That was like, since he was born, since the day he was big enough to walk, he just started smoking crack. He didn't have a single story of him as a free man that did not involve him smoking crack. Or maybe that was just what he chose to talk about. Whatever. So, L didn't have anything. And up until the night that me and him got to fighting, we were halfway okay. But when we were locking that cell was when he would start making this. Dude was off. When I mean off, like completely crazy in the head, is when he would start making the white boy comments. And I told him a couple different times, hey, look, man, chill with the white boy shit. Like, I'm not gonna call you no black boy. See how that sounds? This shit just sounds disrespectful. Don't call me a white boy again. Call me... My name is Jay. You call me by Jay. Your name is L. I call you by L. Don't disrespect me. Too much of it led up, and then we just had it all. But prior to that, L didn't have anything. Soon as I came in a cell, I walk in. A lot of times you walk in a cell, you can tell by how a man's living when you look around. Is the cell clean? Is the toilet clean? Guys will stack their cosmetics on the countertop. Does he got a television? Does he got a stack of CDs? Or is he one of them guys that's got just a prison pamphlet laying on the counter and all state supply cosmetics that was L at the time you could still smoke in prison and we used to get these cans of tobacco called midnight special that's the menthol and then you had a red can for the regular flavor you could order new ports yada 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 and so on and so on no sooner than I walk through the door and I take a look around to see what he's got he ain't got nothing this dude was the definition of Pookie from New Jack City. He was a crackhead. He had from Lynchburg. He had nobody in the world that gave two shits whether he was alive or dead. They weren't gonna send him a penny. He's done stole everybody's air conditioner, stole everybody's food stamps. He's a bad guy in the streets. I start putting my stuff away. He comes up and introduces himself, right? So I go ahead and I roll up a cigarette. 
smoke my cigarette and hey let me catch a, a short on that i don't like that catch a short on the cigarette thing to me it's just nasty we did it when we were younger but i'm like here man so he gets a piece of paper and i reach him out tobacco can i give him some tobacco there you go that's yours i opened the door i should have never opened as i became more seasoned more of a comic so i tell you don't open these doors it was like i took l to raise We'd be in a cell talking. I'd roll up. He'd be like, hey, well, let me get one on real quick. Anything I had, he wanted half of. If I ate something, he wanted some. Bro, you was hustling and making moves before I got in here. This dude would wash people's clothes and do all these different things to make money. But now that you got me in a cell, oh, you think the white boy's going to take care of you, which all led him to the animosity of me whooping L's ass, right? L goes to the hole. Now, I know... For the most part, who's who inside this pod that I live in? A large majority of the guys in here are older convicts. They're laid back. They're lifers. They don't bother nobody, but then you got some that are on this bullcrap. John was on that bullcrap. John had made a name for himself, and he wasn't in there maybe three or four days prior. He had just come in this pod when this whole situation with me and L transpired that night, right? L comes to the cell, and every now and then, over these past few days, he's got like a little bag of chips, a soda. He's got, you know, you get these little bugler pouches of tobacco. They were like a dollar or something. It was like less than an ounce of tobacco. Came with like 20 rolling papers. He's coming up with little things because I don't let him know. Look, I ain't take you to raise, man. I can't take care of me and take care of you. My people don't send enough money, and I, I hustle up in here too. So I can't raise you, man. You got to get out there and continue to get at your own. I think that's really when he started to dislike me once I put my foot down. I was like, well, I'm not your dad, man. He goes to the hole. I've heard about this dude, John, through other people. When he came in the pod, other dudes that have been down a long time was like, oh, man. You talking dudes have been down 20, 30, 40 years, been locked up. They see John coming to the pod, they're like, man, here comes this dude. Well, what's up with him? He's a nut. That's what's up with him, a straight noodle. Hey, go, 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 Dude's off in his head, man. Snorts the dope, messes with the boys, trying to extort people, rob people, keeps a knife on him. He'd have been sent to the supermaxes God knows how many times for stabbing charges and knife charges. So it lets me know, all right, I need to keep my eye on this dude. At this time, I kept a bang. I kept one throughout 95% of my bid, unless I was like in the hole or in the midst of being you know, transferred. So I got to keep my eyes on it, but I got no reason to worry about nothing with this dude. I ain't never had no interactions with this dude, no type of dealings with this dude. I'm good, right? No, you're not good. Always expect the unexpected. Now I tell you, you ain't got to look for trouble. Trouble will come find you. Trouble came and found me. We go to commissary. Come back with my bag. By now, I've got a new cellmate. Aiden and Bartha became my cellmate. I put all my stuff up. Come out and I'm talking to these people. We caught commissary right before it was rec period. So right after commissary, they're calling standby for rec. We're going to go out to the rec yard. You go out if you want to. If you don't want to, you ain't got to go out. Old school walks up on me. And let me, let me holler at you for a minute. And you can tell in the way that somebody approaches you or if they try to lure you over to a blind spot whether it's a good thing or a bad thing what he wanted me to go over to was a blind spot i said now you can holler at me uh right here what's up now come here let me holler at you real quick i'm not gonna say i was scared but i'm not stupid you've got a reputation for stabbing people you got a reputation for not just having a knife but using that knife and to my acknowledgement, I didn't think the man was ever going home. You couldn't convince me he hadn't killed a school bus full of children. But from what I'm hearing, he got out. Now, I come over here and holler at me. I sat down at the table. I said, Yo, if you need to holler at me, man, you can holler at me right here. What's up, man? Mind you now, me and this dude have never spoke. I need to get that up off of you. Here comes the extortion. Here comes that dope fiend larceny he's trying to run. He sees somebody, a younger white dude, somebody he thinks ain't no threat. Got me twisted. Sits down at the table, I need to get that up off you. Get what up off of me? Your cell may L left up out of here owing me money. 
you a cellmate, you got to pay that. Look, man, I ain't got shit to do with what L owes you. No, you got everything to do with it. Because he came and borrowed some stuff from me and told me that he was keeping the cell clean and doing things around the cell for you and that you was going to pay him. So essentially, the money you're supposed to pay him is supposed to go to me. True story. So look, I don't know what you and him got going on. And before I can fully explain to this man that I ain't got nothing to do with that, he gets up. No talking. Head straight over to his cell. I know where he's going. He's going to get his knife. I get up the table, beeline to my cell, go straight in the bam, I get the knife, tuck it inside my pants, and I come to the door and I'm standing there looking at him and he's just standing there looking at me. We had a kind of like a, a standoff. And my cell, like I told you, was situated right in front of the guard booth. I was in cell 24 at the time. He's over in 17, so it's like a diagonal shot, and he's on the bottom tip on the top tier, and he's staring at me, and I'm like, Telling him, like, come here. Like, if you want to continue to talk, come here. We didn't even get to finish saying what we were saying. But I know now there's no more talking. Our talking is done and over with. Whatever's going to happen from this point out is, is going to happen. What he expected to happen is what he was used to happening. He expected me to be like, oh, what happened? Oh, my God, he owes you money. Please don't hurt me. I'll go get it. I didn't let that happen. I stood my ground. Are you going to get yours? I'm damn sure going to get mine. So I kept standing at the door and I did like this. Come in, he just kind of nodded at me. Kept nodding at me. Wouldn't be long, he took his eyes off me and this dude was messed up in the head, just went on back about his business. Put the holler on my homeboy's Richmond and said, yo, what's up with uh with old boy, man? Like, I'm feeling this type of way. Like, I might need to Michael Myers his ass when he ain't looking like, is he somebody I gotta worry about? Nah. He don't know you like that. Like, let me holler at him. I don't need nobody to holler at nobody for me. I just need to know what's up with him because I feel some type of way. Like, he tried to press me on some money that I don't owe him, some money that I'm not going to pay him, but he wants to take shit to a blade. I'd rather just fight because judging by his character, he's very violent, but I don't got him beating me. I just don't. At the time I'm maybe 25, 26 years old, this man had to be in his mid-40s, late-40s. Now, I'm not judging a book by his cover, but I lift weights daily. I run daily. I'm in the greatest shape of my life. This guy is chain-smoking cigarettes like it's the end of the world and he's about to be executed. I don't see you being able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me in the cell and A, cardio-wise, outwin me, or B, be stronger than me, handle me, and be able to beat me. My homeboy Nate tells me, he says, no, nah, hold on, no, no, y'all can't even be doing this. You're from Richmond, too. Us Richmond dudes, we stuck together. We're not supposed to go with each other. We're not a gang, but there's strength in numbers. My city backs the people from their city. I'm going to holler at him. I'm still adamant. I don't want you hollering at nobody for me. That's a sign of weakness. Like, I got another man going to another man regarding my situation. I said, nah, you don't holler nothing, man. Like, if anything, just tell dude that if we need to fight, we can go ahead and fight. I'm not paying him nothing, man. I don't care what him and L got going on. I'm not the one. I'm not letting nobody take nothing from me. I'm not paying nobody else's debt. Maybe he thinks I'm little Timmy or little Jimmy or little Johnny. I'm Jay. I'm not the biggest. I'm not the baddest. I'm not the meanest son of a bitch in the world. But this ain't my first rodeo, man. I've been doing this. I'm going to continue to do this. I got many years to do. I'm not letting nobody take nothing from me. Later that evening, now, by this time, this is the following day. Later that evening, the following day, he comes up. And I just come in from wreck, trying to grab my shower stuff and get my stuff gathered up and head to the shower. I feel his presence at the door. He doesn't say a word. Does it make himself known? Key rule is, you knock on the cell door before you even stick your head around. I can feel there's somebody standing behind me at the door. I'm reaching in my locker to get my soap dish and my towel and washcloth, and I look back and he's standing at the door, so I reach in the locker, I pull the knife out, and I wrap it inside the towel. I turn around, what's up with you? Like, I've already got my shirt off, just came in, I'm hot and sweaty, got a pair of shorts on, got my running shoes on, what's up with you? And he tells me, I ain't even on that type of time. What type of time is it on there? Look, first of all, I thought I had one. I ain't gonna lie. It's what I do. It lasts. 
You held your own. You held your ground. I wouldn't expect anything less. I should have known the way you stood up for yourself. You was from Richmond. Only white boys from Richmond act like that. I'm still on the fence of not letting my guard down. And I feel the type of way you pressed me. So I let it be known. Look, don't ever press me again about some shit that I need to tell you. Look, chill out. That's when I see the cool side of it. Hey, look, look, chill out. My dude ain't owe me no money, man. You know that that dope just hit the yard, and I got to try to figure out a way to get some money in my pocket so I can get some. You know what I mean? Maybe you could just throw me a couple of little things, to, and I can get a couple of other people throw me a couple of little things. I can, you know, get my little swerve on. That's how you talk to me. That's dead, man. I said, you know, had you came and asked me, hey, look, man, I'm doing bad. You think I can get a couple of little items off of you? I'd have gladly gave them to you. But you had tried to apply some pressure on me for what L had going on, like I was just gonna buckle and give you my stuff. Nah, man, can't happen. Not with all these years I got left. Not with all these people standing around. I gotta walk around knowing, even if don't nobody else know, I know, and it ain't gonna happen. Me and dude actually became cool after that. But I did watch him run that same game he tried to run on me with other people, and it worked. He had gotten older. He wasn't going to stab nobody unless he had to. He's at Greensville, which is like a giant project. Greensville's got almost 3,700 people there. When people talk about prison stories, the prison you was at had three, 400 people there. You might not have many stories. When you've been on a compound that's got 3,700 people, oh, you got stories for days. You got stories for years. Now much stuff happens between 3,700 men on a day-to-day -day basis over a 10 year span, a whole lot. And if you see this Banky, big salute. When Banky told me that was his cellmate, I said, what? And he knows when I saw him, I said, was your cellmate? He's like, yeah, man, we was cool. We got along great. He tried me, tried to extort me. That was the, that's that dope fiend larceny we've talked about to go get him some dope. He did end up getting him a couple other little victims. I think he ended up robbing Gizmo and another dude I, that I seen in there from time to time. But all's well ends well. He eventually got jammed up. Dudes got tired of him running around extorting people, robbing people, and they dropped enough notes on him that in due time, the guards came in there, clank, clank, took him up out of there and to the hole. And it wouldn't be long after that he would walk into a new pile full of guys that knew him from doing time with him that I guarantee you was like, ah, oh, man, here we go with this guy. Here we go with this ish. Now, I want you to understand me telling you this story. I don't glorify prison. Prison is the stupidest thing you can ever do in your life. It is the most boring place you can ever go. It's the worst place you can ever go. It is the definition of you have failed at life. But guys are going to try you. You're gonna see things that are gonna shake you to your core. You're gonna see things that you're never gonna forget. But in those moments when you get tested, when somebody pushes up on you, you have one or two options. Do whatever it is they're asking you to do or push back. This is what I can tell you. If you do what they ask you to do, you will do it from that day forward. And at the moment that you push back, you're gonna to have to push back that much harder to get your point across because after you let people take stuff from you nobody believes you if you pull a knife after being extorted they're not going to believe you nip it in the bud and if you don't want to deal with none of that hey try this out don't be a criminal don't break the law don't go to prison don't go to jail it's none of your favorites you're gonna hate life it sucks you're going to be labeled a convicted felon the rest of your life. You're going to be limited in a whole bunch of things that you can do. And you better believe this. There's a John in every single prison in America. And there's always somebody much worse than John. Extortion is real. Happens every day and will continue to happen from now until the end of time. It's amazing what a long, hard day's work can do. I've told y'all these videos, they helped me as well. My day did not start out good at all. I feel a lot better after making this video. Even though I didn't vent much on today's situation, just 
you know, being able to connect with y'all, talk, laugh, think back on the past, relive it, it helps, man. And I also hope that these videos help y'all. I hope that someone will listen and not end up in there. Not everybody's going to stand up for themselves. And you can't say you are because I've seen it time and time again. I've seen small guys not stand up for themselves. I've seen guys that were six foot something want no beef, no type of problems get slapped around and not stand up for themselves. Prison in itself is a nightmare. Somebody asked me one time, if you could sum up prison, how would you sum it up? Imagine falling into your worst nightmare and not being able to wake up for 10 years. That's prison. Sorry about the 10 day hiatus. It's always family first. But as y'all know, we're back. Hope y'all enjoyed today's video. I just got home. Huh. Get in and eat, check on my kids. My feet are soaked, my pants are soaked, my shirt dried, my hat dried on the way home. But anyways, these jails, institutions, these prisons, these facilities, they're all just crazier worlds inside of an already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. Just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life. And to all my real ones and the awesome real ones watching, because y'all still watching me. Man, y'all know how we do. Salute. He tried. Oh, he tried. Can't believe they let that man out. Hide the children. He ain't messing with kids. He's crazy, though. Definitely crazy.